Hey, good way. This isn't a big. This isn't a big faster, and I'm going to breeze through some of these a little bit faster. Much less data. This just kind of more or less give you a handle of what we do with our wisehood and kind of why we do it. It's not the. It's not the trial concept of of a device and information, but just kind of giving you an overview of what's going on. Most of the cons were set up initially. We didn't have any grazing at all. We didn't get our bison hood until '87, and then stop grazing cattle again until 1994. But grazing is important for grassland management as far as increasing the amount of species. And so. If you, this is actually just a comparison between you know, N1A and N1B, upland prairie or lowland prairie, and uh, SPA, SPB that's ungrazed. 60% difference in the increase in species, whether you graze it or not. And if you remember the summer burn, was a similar type of slope for number of species from summer burning. So species richness. Uh, is much, much higher in any grazed pasture. The question becomes is, since this grassland evolved initially under bison grazing and then 150 years ago we kicked off all the bison and put on the cattle, and now cattle has been more or less considered the standard, and we have bison out here now, so they say, well, is it the same? Is things going on is a little different depending on whether you have bison or whether you have cattle. And so generally you look at it and say, well, if you have cattle, we know there are some differences, and one of them is, if you got cattle, you better feed during the winter. If you don't, you're going to have a mess of dead cattle. You also got to be chopping ice. I never could understand that guy chopping the ice standing on the pond when he was chopping it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, cattle like to hang out in the shade. We know cattle like to hang out in the water. We know bison stay on the uplands and create the wallows. And they create these huge grazing lawns that they grub down pretty heavy. We know that cattle also create uh, these grazing spots. It's just that they're not as big. So we know there are some differences between bison and cattle, just based upon general observations. But a lot of general observations can be misleading because somebody can drop, drive by a pasture and says, well, look how good that pasture looks, it's grazed by bison. Look how bad this pasture looks, it's grazed by cattle. And so there's this inherent belief that because cattle are exotic, that they've got to be bad for the prairie. And that since bison are native and they grew up in the prairie, by gum, they've got to be the best thing for the prairie you can have. And generally, uh, a lot of misconceptions about what's going on has been uh, from the, some of these ranchers that overstock the heck out of the pastures with cattle. And then they look at a bison pasture that is grossly understocked, and they, it's comparing apples and oranges. You just, you, you're not looking at the same thing just because it's a bison pasture or cattle pasture. So what we did in 1995, we said we needed to have a little better handle of uh, how bison are affecting the uh, prairie compared with cattle, and we need to make manage it so that everything is the same, rather than just some little differences. So what we did, we set up eight pastures in the cattle unit. These were twelve, and, uh, eight, well, it was twelve and a half acre pastures, and I had eight of them, so I had four replications for each treatment. Each treatment consisted of four bison or four cattle. We, we managed this so that the total weight of these four animals was the same as the total weight of these four animals. And that was the same way across all eight pastures. So the weight of the animals going on was the same. And this was important because for every age and sex class, <coughs> cattle weigh more than bison. So just because you may have 50 cattle out on a pasture and 50 bison in this pasture doesn't mean the intake of it is the same. Because those 50 cattle are going to be eating more grass because they weigh more. So it's important to balance the, the weight of the animals out. So we, we put them out on the same time, pull them off at the same time in the fall. We burn the pastures uh, annually in the spring. And uh, then I compared all the vegetational changes going on in the pastures with ungrazed prairie. This was a 13-year study. 
Well, I'll show you just a little bit of data to give you a handle of how uh, the cattle may differ in some aspects. This is ungrazed prairie increase in warm season grasses. You'd expect that. You know that big blue in an and any grass increase in the spring running. Cattle grazing maintain big blue stem Indian grass. I, I say big blue and Indian. This actually included all warm season grasses, but big blue and Indian, little blue with the three dominants. And actually a little decrease over time with bison grazing. Cool season grasses, uh, we know that it decreases under spring burning, increase under bison grazing, increase under cattle grazing. Annual forage fluctuate widely from year to year depending upon precipitation patterns, low in ungrazed uh, areas and high in grazed areas, and generally most years higher in bison pastures and in cattle. And this, I love this. I love this graph. Because any time you can dispel some false information with data, good hog data, it's great. So everybody's cranking their heads and saying, what the heck does this tell me? You take any wildflower book, any wildflower book you want, open it up to the legume section, and every one of them going to talk about how great legumes are. Cattle will relish them. They'll seek them out. They'll grow them down. And this was actually started from in the 1960s from a, a really nice book called Arranging Pasture Plants by the Phillips uh, Petroleum Company. Watercolor uh, pictures, really great pictures. But every one of them in there, they talk about how great the legumes are. And everybody that's wrote a wildflower book since then has read that and said, well, yeah, it must be true. Phillips said it is. Under cattle grazing, legumes increased. And I can guarantee you, if cattle are seeking them out, eating them up, cover of the legumes would not be increasing. Increased under bison grazing, but increased most under cattle grazing. No, no change at all under ungrazed areas. Lead plant, the most common uh, legume we had out there, Phillips Petroleum book said uh, that cattle were relish it, seek it out, rub it down. <coughs> Increase like heck under uh, cattle grazing, small increase under bison grazing, no change over time under under uh, ungrazed situation. The importance of this is that may be true. That cattle may seek out legumes in some areas, but just like every dang thing else I've been trying to talk about today is just because it applies in some areas doesn't mean it applies here. You go out in western Kansas and they may grub down legumes. But for us, they got better things to pick from. And, and actually, Purple Prairie Clover, all those books talk about Purple Prairie. In fact, even a, a new one that came out, the, the freebie of uh, Ira Lee uh, put out. She, she sent me a copy on it. I said, boy, you, this is so long. Because you talk about the Jews, Purple Prairie Club will be relished. And it's not. Because I guarantee you, if it was relished, it wouldn't be increasing. And uh, although this led by the uh, Purple Prairie Club did the same thing, it was the most common uh, herbaceous of the So there's a lot of misconceptions about what's going on. And a lot of these were formed by uh, two reasons. One, it came from different areas other than Flint Hills grassland. And two is, they may have been over the stock in the heck out of the cattle. And I guarantee you, if you have 50 cattle on 10 acres of uh, land, they're going to be eating the legumes. They're going to be eating anything that has any green to it at all. And so this was, this was normal stock. In fact, it was just a tad heavier than normal stocking of what we recommend for uh, seasonal grazing, the plant hills. But under, under normal grazing, Seasonal uh, grazing of uh, either bison or cattle. They're not eating the legumes. Gene, all they got to do is go out on the bison, you know, when the, when the flowering plants are really flowering the, the legumes, and then when you walk Butterfly Hill, look across the pasture out there where the cattle, you know, graze. And it, it tells you that, 
your charge right. Well, my job. <laughs> my job's right. <laughs> yeah, my job reflects reflects uh, uh, 13 years of uh, for replicated data, and and, and so uh, I mean we you never know. Back in in uh, 08, if we did it, may have dropped down the hill. But all I'm saying is this 13 year study. Legumes were, did, were not being consumed to the point where you could see a change in their cover. Now that doesn't mean there isn't cafeteria grazing. Say, well, I saw them eat the head off of a plant. Well, that's just going through sewing stockade and, and putting, a little, <laughs> putting a little bit on your plate. But it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that they're seeking it out. Oh, we're off a yucca. <laughs> so, and so I, I I really like that because it it. It uh, dispels uh, some common information about uh, what's going on with cattle grazing, that they really seek out these legumes when it, that's just a fallacy, really. But not saying they don't do it under heavy stocking, but under normal stocking, you know. Heath Astor, big increase of fall <coughs> with uh, cattle rising grazing, and really declines under non graze situations when it's annually burned. And this is actually a cool one. Uh, one of the big differences between cattle and bison. Missouri Golden Rod just mm -hmm. exploded in bison pastures. Increased under ca in cattle pastures, maintained itself under migration. So the, you'd go out to the bison pastures and it was a solid sea of yellow. Golden Rod increased. And it's not necessarily that uh, they weren't eating it and cattle were eating it. That's not the issue. The issue was that the, the bison were grubbing the area around it so much that it, it uh, lowered the, the competitiveness of a lot of other plants and Goldenrod took advantage of that and they just went hard wild. <coughs> so you've got some new research going on with the DNA. I, I actually get to that. All right. Then I'm gonna... Can you wait on that? I can. So what was your stocking rate for this study? This was three acres per head. We consider normal stocking for seasonal grazing at three and a third acres. So this was just a little heavier than normal. But what I wanted to do was to push the system a little bit. So it was, it, it was a little heavier than, than what you would normally think of. So I, the, the other thing is, is that at the end of the season, we went out and clipped the heck out of the pastures, did an estimate of how much grass was remaining at the end of the season. Bison removed 57. This is the amount in the ungrazed areas that we had. This is the amount in the grazed areas. Bison removed 50%, cattle removed 47 This is pretty close to we want, what we like to achieve is take half, leave half concept. So the, uh, the cattle were, were uh, about achieving what a uh, desire was. The bison were removing a little more grass than the bison. Then uh, the bison were removing more than the cattle, keeping in mind that the stocking rate was the same, the weight of the animals was the same. So basically, intake should have been the same. Was the weight of the animals the same when they were taken off? Did they weigh the same? Did they, yeah, or did the cows? Well, no, because because. That's why I, when I uh, wrote this up, we never mentioned anything at all about animal performance because it's not fair to compare animals' performance when you're talking about two-year-old bison. I had to use two-year-old bison in order to match up weights with the annual, uh, with uh, yearlings cattle. So they've been gaining more animals. And so cattle have been bred for a long time to be highly efficient producers. Bison have not. And so it's meaningless to try and compare weight gain. Uh, and so I didn't even uh, I didn't even look at pounds per head per day for bison and pounds per head per day for cattle because it's it's not comparable. It didn't uh, for this study it didn't it didn't mean anything. And, and the actually the objective is just to <coughs> vegetational changes as a result of whether that prairie was being grazed by cattle or whether it was being grazed by uh, bison. So, 
Uh, Cato, uh, uh, one, one second, don't, don't leave that slide yet. <laughs> I, I had somebody who took a, a bison of tour come up and, and asked me if he could buy some bison when after Roundup. Buy some bison? Buy some bison. <laughs> and he said because he was told during the, the bison loop that the, the bison, you know, because they are evolved to this area, utilize the prairie much more efficiently than cattle. Yeah. And he said, all you have to do is look at the poop and you can see how they utilize the, the, the prairie. It's, bison poop is so much different from cattle poop, and you can see that they've got this natural evolution to, to get all the nutrients out of the prairie that the bison, or that the cattle poop. He's full of poop. And that's what I said. I said, really? <laughs> like they told you that? Because it's, well, it's the same microbe. See, there's a, there was a lot of, of a belief about bison that's based purely on junk, that bison are this mystical creature that because it is native it is so much better and so good. In fact, there was, a, there was even a stupid book this gal wrote and says you can go throw uh, your moldy hay to bison because they eat it. They, they've evolved to eat all kinds of junk. So if you got moldy hay, just throw it to your bison or cattle won't eat it. Well, it's stupid. If you want to kill your bison, throw them in the But uh, uh, people have this concept. At least people who sit uh, behind the desk and don't have anything to do uh, play on the internet. They have it, this concept that bison uh, have got to be so great, utilize the forage more efficiently. Now, they, they're all different. That's what this whole talk is. They're all differences. But it's not like night and day and that. Uh, you can tell. In fact, at the at the end of uh, this cattle bison study, at the end of the season, you could walk out there and you could not tell any differences between the pastures except for goldenrod. If if you knew that the goldenrod meant uh, bison grazing, then you'd say, "Well, that's a bison pasture." But I would take people out all the time. And say, okay, which pasture is a bison pasture and which pasture is a cattle pasture? And I can guarantee you every time if the animals went out there that they could see, every time they guessed wrong. Beyond a doubt, even Nature Conservancy people, they guessed wrong. Said that's got to be a bison pasture because it looks so good. People have this misconcept about. These animals. Well, and I think the poop thing is that the cattle <coughs> drink more water. Well, you know, we'll get hey, we'll get to that. I've right. got, I've actually, I actually will touch on some of that. <laughs> Forbs at the end of the season. Forbs at the end of the season. A lot more Forbs in bison pastures and in cattle pastures. It, this does not necessarily mean that cattle are eating more Forbs. It just meant, could very well mean that the the. Uh, Bison were creating conditions that was more favorable for for growth, and I'll, I'll back that statement up here in a moment. But and grade forbs was the lowest amount. So anyway, bit significant differences between cattle and bison pastures on uh, forbs, and the reason why there's some a lot of differences, and this is the pasture I take people out to and say, okay, which which pastures which, and this was right after we had burned. Totally burned. Complete. Real spotty. It's the bison pasture. Bison. Cat. And had four pastures of, of each treatment, but exactly the same. This was just the only fence line contrast. So what happens is on these cattle uh, on these uh, cattle pastures, they burn more completely. Remember, they had there was more residual grass at the end of the season, so they burn more completely, and they don't have these big grazing lawns. These big grazing lawns that a bison create, nothing burns in them. So these also create conditions for the growth of plants that would otherwise be sensitive to fire. So here you have complete burning, or more, more complete. I mean, that's still. Area so then burn. You have more complete burning in cattle pastures, so you get rid of more of these plants that are sensitive to fire. Okay, um, is it taken into consideration? It's my understanding that the bison here are not inoculated.
for you know any diseases other than what a couple things. But and the cattle you put out, I understand they're the same weight as the bison. But are the cattle, do they get more shots, more medicines? Would, would that affect why they, you know, don't eat, don't knock it down as much? Is, it, is that taken into consideration, or should it be? Uh, I, I think, I think that's probably really stretching it. Um, but wait till I get to what we do with the bison, and I talk a little bit. We, we do inoculate our bison. Uh, with, with some stuff, uh, but we don't get, for these animals, for these animals that was on this test, we didn't give them any uh, growth hormones or feed additives, the medicine or anything like that. The cat. Well, well they were, yeah, they were yearlings. We okay. didn't give anything to them. I mean, I'm just... But it, that, that shouldn't affect their eating. It might affect their... their uh, their growth performance, but it, uh, it, it really shouldn't affect what they select. Now, uh, I talk a little bit about when we get to the management of the bison a little bit. So, I want to get back to this, finish this up. Because these areas are so spotty, there's a lot more species that can grow in, in these bison areas, and thus we have more species in the bison pasture than we do in the cattle pasture. Still, much, much, much more significant than in an ungrazed Watershed. And this is just another shot of the bison pasture. No growth, I mean, not, no hardly at all, any, but this was the half acre of ungrazed that we fenced off. Each pasture had a half acre of ungrazed in it. So, cattle pastures didn't look like this, except by the water tank. And well, when I get to the water section, I'll talk about it a little bit more. We had to haul water to the, all these pastures. Okay, so we, we manage a bison herd with the objective of removing 25% of the grass production each year. So we, it's not that we have a set number of animals out there. It generally runs around 300, but we base it upon the animal units, uh, which means the, the weight of the individual animals, add them up, and it comes out about 300. That's what we are shooting at currently, based upon current calculations. <laughs> Illustrating that the grass is always green. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have we have about 2,400 acres in the bison area, uh, divided into 10 watersheds. Of those, two of them are burned annually. Two of them are burned on a biannual basis. Two of them are unburned, and four of them are burned every four years sequentially. So any one year we burn four watersheds, and then the bison can pick and choose from the watersheds that they want. But what they do is, in the watershed that has been four years since it's been burned, is where they concentrate their burning. This year we burned N4C. This will be where they hang out heaviest in the early spring. N4C. Because, well, why? Forage quality is highest. Everything those animals do is governed by forage quality. You get highest forage quality off an infrequently burned watershed. And then the next highest will become from the annually burned watershed. So they'll be hitting it. And then they won't be spending much time at all except passing through. And the of watersheds that are unburned, why except is, in the fall. Why is the forage quality better in the four year that was just burned than the one year that was just Well, because you've had, you, you've got all this uh, buildup of nitrogen in the soil from four years. Okay. Of, so it hasn't had to pull out of the brand new growth right. for four years. Forage quality, that is always highest. And just to uh, mention about summer burning on this, because it would be so cool, and I tried to do this and they weren't wet me, to do summer burning in the grazed watersheds. This is our SPB uh, and this is SPA. This was taken two months after it was burned, so this was in October. Everything around it here senesced. Green, high forage quality. I can guarantee you, right here's the bison fence, 
the bison was standing there with the tongues hanging out, <laughs> saying, how can I get to that? You go out there in the mornings, every deal on conjure is in those watersheds. This is high forage quality at a time in which otherwise forage quality is really, really, really going downhill. So summer burning can be very advantageous to provide some nutritional quality to the animals without having to go out and throw them a pound of cubes or whatever. That good grass, but they, we, we don't burn that uh, in the great watershed. We don't do some of burning. I wanted to, but they won't let us do it. What's the reason they won't let like? Long-term research. And that's all I said. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just so that you know, I put through there too fast. We identify our animals with the rear tags. You probably already know this, just in case you forgot. White tags means it's born in the uh, 1990s. The first year, uh, number is the year they were born, so that was born in 92. Yellow tags uh, with the 2000s. This one was 017, so she was born in 2000. And then for the 2010s, we have orange tags. We only have uh, nine white tags that are left in the herd. Before that, there used to be blue tags for the 80s, but the blue have all bit the dust. And, and the white tags were all girls, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But the boys, long time, went away. And the greens are all gone, too? There's only one green left. Uh, green just... I would want to <laughs> And that's for a different talk. Um, this was last year's first calf. Didn't make it either. She died midway through summer. Um, last year was the third highest year of calves. We had a good calf up last year. Just to give you an idea, 65% uh, annual calf crop. Uh, but, it, but it varies quite a bit from a low of, in the 40s. If you're in the bison business or cattle business, you want to be in business long, that's 65% calf crop. But under all of hood, in which we don't supplement, uh, it's uh, quite well. So what we do every year, we have a roundup, and the, one of the functions of the roundup is to remove the animals that we don't need to keep the herd size at the desirable 213 animal units. We will take all new uh, calves with both visual and then we start an electronic ID tag. I'll talk about it in a little bit. We weigh the animals. We have the longest ever weight of bison hood. We started weighing in 1994 and so it's the, uh, it's the foundation for all weights of what's going on with a uh, uh, wild herd. Uh, we uh, vaccinate the heifer calves. We, in 2000, we started giving uh, ivermectin to uh, control parasites. Uh, the bison were badly infested. They had a research study looking at the poops they have, uh, of bison, and they were badly infested with parasites. So we started giving them ivermectin to help them get through the winter in a better condition until we didn't have as much stress on the animals of getting through the winter. So it, it, that was just a, a management decision we made to help the animals out uh, for parasite control stuff. It's just a shot. Give them a, give them a shot. So Roundup involves honking them in. If you have a bed pickup, <laughs> don't honk your horn. <laughs> See, this is, this is an old picture because the pickup's pretty clean. <laughs> it's not too much junk in there. Yeah, no gill damage. Uh, yeah, no gill damage. Um, we don't bound the bison up forcefully. We ask them to come in gently. If they want to come in, they come in. If they don't want to come in, they don't. Last year, we didn't have uh, 56 animals decided they didn't want to come in, which is the worst ever that we've had. So it's, it's more or less enticing them to come in. We entice them with range cubes. We don't feed animals uh, at any time other than in emergency situations, and then it's just prey hay. But 
when you go out in the uh, fall, you open a bag of cubes, they smell that protein. And like I said earlier, protein is the most limiting quality they have, and everything they do is governed about increasing it. So when they smell a bag of protein, they come running. So, they know my pickup because they associate it with those cues. That's why you can go out there on a red pickup and you can get mobbed. Even though they're colorblind, they can tell the shape. They, they know, I can guarantee you, we've done it before. Take a white pickup out, take a red pickup out, and they'll go to the red pickup every time. So they're not completely cut. Either that or they, they see the damage of that. <laughs> I, say, I say, I know that pickup. Because they, they, they tore the heck out of my pickup. They knocked a uh, silk, a uh, real meal off. Side we we have pictures of you petting the bison. No, 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 don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it out, I'll take it out. Don't say that. That's, yeah. When you said you took the red pickup and a white pickup, was the red pickup yours, or did you yeah, use a yeah. different oh, red? No, no. Because no. perhaps <laughs> they used it. Someone take my Adam's pickup out there and let them tear it up. <laughs> no, I've taken Earl's old orange pickup, and yeah, they come right up to it. Right up to it. Uh, there's a... Uh, I thought they might smell the food still. No, red. well, I don't, I don't kill you. Uh, cubes around with me uh, all the time, and so it's, it, it's not that uh, it's that they just know the pickup. And uh, in fact, uh, a few years ago, there's, a, there's another pickup on uh, campus that has read, and the people that was running the wells in M4D borrowed it to get to it. It was Tony's pickup, and the bison saw it. This was in the spring. <laughs> The spring and the fall is a two bad time. Summertime they don't kill because they're getting all the protein they need off the grass. And uh, they mobbed they mob that pickup and the people couldn't, they've been down the well and they couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't get to the pickup. So I, I, saw, I saw that they were trapped. <laughs> and so I, uh, I honked the, the bison away from them, but they didn't know the difference between Tony's pickup and my pickup. So what do we do? Uh, we move animals to keep our uh, animal hood size at 213. When we move, if you get seven years old, you're gone. If you're a male. Uh, we take off the uh, yearlings when they're uh, the lower half of them. Two-year-olds, uh, males, we only keep five to six is just a rough number. Sometimes we keep up to eight or nine. Uh, Two year and we end up keeping females to keep, stay in the hood about the uh, heaviest 15. Uh, if you don't have a calf in two years, you're gone. I'll give you one year, but I ain't going to give you two. You used, used to give them three years, but now it's two. Old cows, uh, we start weeding them out. Uh, if they don't have a calf, they, they only get one year grace when they're uh, only 15. And then this one, <laughs> this is important. We used, we had a we had a calf. Uh, they called it Daisy that was bottled but fed. Our policy normally is we don't mess with orphans. But uh, one of the researchers found this calf that was sucking on the insulator on the fence, <laughs> and so uh, first calf picked him up and uh, brought him in. And so after you brought him in, said, "Well, you got it." <laughs> That was Daisy was her name. And so Daisy was bottle fed and a pet. And the worst thing you can have is a pet bison. Because as soon as they get to be about 300 pounds, they realize that they're bigger than you. And they can do whatever they want. We had Daisy out in the pasture and I thought she was going to kill me one time. Because she wanted cubes. And I didn't have any cubes. I was out there plant stuff. And she got belligerent because she couldn't get her cubes. And she actually, it was a base between me and her. This was back when I had a good knee. Because <laughs> right now, I should have killed me, I'm sure. But I outran that puppy. <laughs> and I, I, I actually ran through the fence and jumped. I jumped through that fence. And then I turned around and said, you're dead. And so we sold her that next. Cause we can't tolerate that. We got people out there and we can't have animals chasing them. If they're not scared of people, they won't be scared off with them, then they're dangerous. And we had a cow a couple years ago that way. 
an old cow, and she'd see people out on the ground, she'd come after them. And you may say, well, you're weeding for animal behavior by doing that, but it's still a safety issue. You know, we can't have grad students. We, it's hard enough getting grad students the way it is. They go out there and <laughs> cow taking out half of them. <laughs> I mean, the cow's taking them. I'll tell you what, we can't. We, we got to do something about that. So we, those are the cold criteria. We also, Lucky Strike got hit by lightning. He got cold. He lived, uh, one lived, tripod had his foot <laughs> in places he should have had it. And then our two-headed cow, we weeded her out too. I actually like, I love that. <laughs> Coyotes, you know, going back to that two-headed cow one, that, that was last year. And uh, it was a bone day and I, uh, before we was burning, I was driving around and saw her that she was having trouble calving. And uh, she was walking around and there was two coyotes following her. Uh, and they knew that lunch was on the table, ready to be served. And we went and burned and I went back and uh, found the cow. Coyotes had already drank the calf off. Them coyotes got a pretty good sense of I think I've heard too. Oh, they ain't get up. Okay, just the just cat. Just cat. Yeah. Okay, so just so you know where we're at, animal-wise, we've got um, 320 animals currently in the hood, more than what we really want, but we had a lot of animals that didn't come in last roundup. But we're, we're heavy on the young calves before we start weeding them out, and then um, all these bulls. These six bulls that are seven years old will go this year. So just real quickly, uh, some of the stuff we're doing with the bison. This year we started electronic ear tagging. I've got uh, 130 animals out there that have these little white tags in their ears. All the calves that had came in and then some select animals after that. And eventually we're going to have the whole hood that have these electronic tags. And we'll be setting the system up uh, in a couple of weeks where we weigh these animals as they out in the field. So they'll cross this platform. In fact, you see the platform and be up there on uh, for the exit gate by uh, so going in. So we have permission to put the, the platform in, the weight? Permission. What's that? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> It, it's in the process, so it'll be out. It'll be out there in a couple of weeks, and uh, so just the animals will be walking across the scale, and it uh, automatically record what the weight is. And that way, we can follow what weight changes all throughout the year. So the scale will be put in, in the gates between fence. Between yeah, between phase one and phase two up there by that, but on the west loop uh, for your exit uh, into four B. That's where that scale is going to go. So that's just that's one we're just starting this year. Uh, the other thing we do is, is monitor uh, who's dropping calves, so we can use that as a cold criteria. Since there's, there's no sense having a cow out there if she isn't dropping a calf. And so from that we've derived this data. Two-year-olds very seldom do they drop calves. Last year we actually had two calves. The two-year-old dropped a calf. Uh, maximum increase it goes up to 83 percent when they're uh, nine years old, and then it starts dropping. And uh, then actually, what happens is uh, the raw exceptions. We've had seven cows that's dropped a calf eight years in a row, and that's remarkable. It really is for unsupplemented conditions. Uh, this tough had three that's popped out calves nine years in a row, and, and I reckon 11 calves in a row. She missed a year, so we sold her. When the year we sold her, she was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was a baby machine. And, and that's good because that's, that's income. But uh, you still got to use some criteria to weed them out uh, after they get. So, and I actually, when they start getting old like this, the quality of the calves really starts dropping. I didn't put that slide in. But the weight of the calves is really small. For these young females and for the older females, really small calves. You get your best calves of this middle age. Best calves being heaviest. 
and most likely to survive. A little bit on who's doing the breeding, a lot of misconceptions here. <clears throat> we started doing genetic testing uh, about six years ago. From that we can determine who the males are. We run males at about a, a four to one, one ratio. That means that each male, each mature male, which is three years old or older, has four females at his disposal, in theory. And, and so I just picked one year of the rut of uh, uh, 2008 was the offspring, so the rut was in 2000, uh, I mean 2008, and the calves were born in 2009. We had seven, bull, uh, we had six bulls that were seven years old, two of them did the, the bulk of the breeding. One of them bred th uh, had 13 calves, one of them had 12 calves, one five calves, one did only bred two females, and two of them only bred one female. So just because you're a heavy bull don't mean you're doing much breeding. You gotta have the attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Five-year-olds, we had eight of them, and, and most of them got in there and got a few of the females pregnant. Uh, Four-year-olds, which were small, had, we had six of them, two of them did uh, bred one cow each. Three-year-olds, which is equates that to, you know, 18-year-old kid. Uh, they um, had six of them, two of them did some breeding, and two-year-old, these are like, uh, Adolescents <laughs> uh, had 37 of them, two of them actually bred a cow. And it's not like these guys are competing with these guys. These guys are hanging around the females all the time. These guys take off to themselves. Say, hey, I don't want to be bothered with the females until it's what time. These guys are hanging around, so if the female comes in the heat, these guys are there. So they'll, they'll why they're doing the breeding. It's not like they're competing against them. But we maintain a ratio of about four bulls to uh, four cows to a bull, so that there's not much fighting between the big bulls. Uh, some of these herds maintain a natural ratio of whatever that it is, one to one. And there's a lot of fighting goes on, and because of that, there's a lot of injuries, fences torn down, and it's just an issue we don't want to deal with. So. These guys, uh, during the bulk of the breeding, some of them, uh, but others just say, ain't worth it. <laughs> Another research project that we just published on last year was whether these puppies get their water. They get it from water that we looked through and said, I don't even want to walk in it. <laughs> and, um, most of the most of the drinking water they did uh, isotopes and determined most of the water was coming on puddles and wallows. And if you think about it, it makes sense evolutionary wise. There was not a lot of streams and there's no ponds. The only waters available to the bison basically were these wallows that that hold water in the spring. So bison can handle that, drink that water fine. Cattle walk by it, say I. Am Ain't no way of sticking my nose in it. And it was quite evident with our cattle bison study, when we first set that out, we had to haul water to all the pastures. We had one tank of water for each pasture. And totally insufficient. The cattle would sit there and just slurp that out. So we put two tanks in the, bi in the, in the cattle pastures and one tank in the, in the bison pastures. The bison would be quite fine. They got by with a lot less water and water that they would get from natural sources out in the field. So the, the bison can handle much lower water throughout the season than cattle. Cattle need a, a lot more water than bison do. Now we never actually measured the amount of water because that was involving stuff that we didn't have time for the money to invest in the equipment. But <clears throat> just anecdotally we know that the bison drink a lot less water and cattle do, and that they're quite willing to drink water from just jump. I've got pictures, I didn't put them in there, but I figured go sit way out. I'm drinking, drinking out of a wallow that's just filled with fecus. You look at that and say, God, I don't even want to stick my hand in that. <laughs> Dietary analysis this is one we're uh, just looking at, we're finishing up now, a five-year study. It's generally assumed that bison 
uh, much more selective on eating grasses than cattle. The cattle eat more uh, variety diet, more forbs into the uh, into the system than what bison do. Bison being primarily grass eaters, but a lot of that's based on anecdotal stories, and not science. And the bison do stuff shift in their diet in uh, times in which protein quality is low. And one of the times is in the fall, you know they're eating the heck out of buckbush berries. Now, grass still is the main component, because they got to uh, fill the rumen up, and they're never going to fill the rumen up with buckbush berries. But it, it does provide some dietary supplementation to them. So we're actually doing a DNA analysis on um, for their diet, which is uh, going to be the first bison DNA diet. <coughs> so we have five years of data on that. There should be there's some good stuff. It's interesting stuff about what they actually are consuming based on DNA. Not we don't we're not able to quantify it of how much. Say well they're eating ten pounds of it. We just say well we know they're eating it. And some of the stuff's surprising, like dogwood. Okay, lastly, uh, one of the studies uh, started uh, six years ago, GPS tracking, we put collars on, we had 15 collars, animals, followed their movements around, because of budget cuts we had to change antennas, <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it, guess it wasn't a good one. <laughs> slide was just so cool. I, I had about three animals that had these uh, flags. They put the flag on them. So it's like the new antennas. And then, it's, <laughs> and then uh, the, 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 the cool story behind this one is uh, the, these things are about $2,000 each. So I picked, this was just uh, two years ago. Took that uh, collar off and threw it in the back of my truck. <laughs> A couple weeks later, Gladstone says, we got a problem, we got a bison loose on campus. <laughs> <laughs> bison running loose on campus. <laughs> I said, I just follow, I just lead him back to Congress in my truck. <laughs> so, uh, I, the, the take home on this is, uh, is that we manage our herd for research and conservation purposes. We're not a production management herd. So what what we do is not in jive with what somebody who, that actually raises bison for a living does. Because you never put them out on the pastures in the winter and not provide supplemental feed to them. It's to your financial benefit to do that. Even though they can get through the winter without the feed, they get to a better increased calf crop, increased calving weights, more likely to recycle and breed the next year if you do that. So you do a lot of management things that we don't do. Uh, and which is really nice because back when back from when I worked in agronomy, I'd fish to lay animals and I'd have to go out cattle. I'd have to go out and bust ice for them and feed them every winter. They're every stupid day. You don't have to do that with bison. And that is nice. <laughs> and so there are advantages to bison versus cattle. So yes, there's differences, but sometimes those differences are pretty small. And it just depends on what you're doing. If you have to go out and feed them and bust ice, then it's a major difference. But if you're looking at changes in vegetation, it's relatively minor. Yeah. Go right ahead. Okay. I noticed, I noticed in your uh, product, your calf uh, production was the lowest, like in 2004, at 44%. And on your plant slides, you had some anomalies back in about that time range. Do you compare your production with the bison? Um, the, the plants with the bison? Uh, not the plant species. We have did, We have did stuff with biomass. Uh, actually, there's more of a relationship uh, between the, uh, the calving and the weights of the calves based on precipitation patterns and when that precipitation falls. 
uh, it's really important to the bison on when the precipitation falls. Uh, so just because you get 34 inches of rainfall doesn't mean squat uh, if it occurs at a time in which it is not helpful. The most helpful time is like in August. So it goes back to that forage quality. Yeah. Okay. But species wise, no, because uh, because the species stuff basically came from the uh, unguised watersheds. Okay, do you have a prediction for this year for forage quality, for bison herd composition, baby production? Well, we've made predictions in the past. In fact, we published a paper on predicting what was going to go on. <laughs> And the first year after we published it, <laughs> says didn't didn't fit the model. <laughs> um, it, it, it just reflects the importance of long term. You can you can have one. I mean, we had twenty years of data too. But we had we had a lot of snow. And um, I I can't predict. I can't. I don't have a good handle of calf crop. Uh, I don't have a handle at all on, on what the calves might do. Uh, I know that the winter was tough on the animals. But last year the animals went through the drought of the year before and uh, it was the third best calf crop ever. The, the weights were really, really, really bad. But. Um, no, I'm, I, I don't want to predict anything yet. <laughs> I can predict that the fecals will be really, really sloppy in May and really, really hard in November. <laughs> <laughs> what was the cow loss with the severe winter? Did you, or the, the bison loss during the winter? How many, how many died during the winter? With this the winter? Well, I'm not going to know exactly <coughs> until the next roundup. Okay. But uh, I've, since, since first of the year, I, we found, and you see this is key, finding. Cause just because it dies, don't mean you find it. Uh, we found three adults. I mean, the yearlings, I never, I never know because you never find a dead body yearling. Uh, so I won't know that until the next round and say, who's missing? Say, well, they're gone. And if you don't catch 50 of them, you may not know either. Well, we, we identify everyone that's ah. not out. So I know every animal that was not uh, in for the roundup. I know the identity of it, and that's why I took off from the inventory those animals that I couldn't find, which three of them were old males. <laughs> they they did, but they also ended up dying. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, you mentioned about the the uh, females and that you knew the calves. Do the, are they born during the daytime? I mean, how do you keep track personally of, of each cow? I spend my I spend <laughs> uh, calves start dropping in mid August. I mean, in mid April. So I spend. 24 hours a day out there. Uh, no. Do they, do they? No, no, what it is is I do have I do have other jobs that's expected of me. And so I can't observe them 24 hours a day. Yeah. Uh, so what I do, I do keep a running inventory of the animals on, on who has a calf. Mm -hmm. And then um, I look for calves whenever I'm before I head in whatever I'm doing. And you can generally tell pretty well. Uh, you see a cow off by herself. In fact, that, that picture that I've shown of the cow that just dropped the calf, the, the first calf, I had seen her off by herself. And anytime you see a cow off by herself in the early spring, you can deduce that she's probably getting ready to drop the calf. Doesn't always mean that. Because one time I saw a cow drop a calf and there was a mess of animals around it too. And I had a three-year-old bull that come up. And the cow was just still looking on the calf. And the bull, just <coughs> being at my butt head, came up, reached down with his horn, and picked that calf up and tossed it. Oh, and, and I ran him off uh, with my truck. But the mom wasn't going to do anything because she can't stand up to a three-year-old bull. 
she don't weigh nearly as much as three-year-old girl does. And so why did that beat the heck out of me? But one of the reasons why they do go off by themselves generally is just to get away from other animals. And they'll stay away from the herd for, depending upon the individual, for three or four days and then join back up in the herd. So a lot of it is I only have a general estimate of the day they were born. And generally I don't have a time. I can't say, well, the time of birth was 11.45. Yeah. <laughs> but I did, actually did send an email out last year. Birth uh, on the birth announcement, because I was there when she popped out. And, uh, and the, the mom didn't object to me being there. And, but when I got my chain out to help pull it, and then so when she objected. <laughs> More? Enough? On your um, busting of the uh, myths on the uh, plant selection from the bison to the cattle. Yeah? Same sort of books like out of Leopold talking about the disappearance of the compass plant. Do we have any data as to why some of those species have been impacted so bad? Well, now, this is, you're, going to, you're going to put me in a position in which I'm going to counter some of your beliefs. Uh -huh. But, I mean, that's, isn't that what oh, science is? Yeah, that was Iowa. I think. Yeah, isn't that, that what science is all about? Uh, compass plant is generally regarded as a Fresh cream plant, mm -hmm. one that, and you look in any book, they say, oh, they the select it, seek it out, grub it down. And I'm not saying it isn't, but in this area, it's not as good as an ice cream plant for the bison as Big Blue Stem and Indian grass. Mm -hmm. And that we have areas out, you know, grazed area, which is compass plant. And so if it was a nice clean plant that they were selectively going out to grub out, you'd say, well, we wouldn't expect to find it at all. Mm -hmm. So it's still, it's, that's just one of those plants that it doesn't do well under heavy grazing anyway, but uh, it's not that they're selectively grubbing it out. We have it out in our grazed area. But when you go back east, the whole philosophy on grazing and plant sensitivity to grazing <coughs> is quite, quite different. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of those things you can't necessarily apply what somebody has determined to occur in one area and say, well, it's going to occur in plant areas. So um, they had the plants they like, but I, I have yet to find a plant that they, in our bison hood, or in our uh, cattle hood either, for, for the areas that we monitor vegetational changes, they haven't grubbed anything out as far as eliminating it. But when you talk to some of these conservation-minded people, which they think that cattle are the worst thing, or grazing in general is the worst thing that never happens, that they would argue that, no, it's really bad. But I'd also argue, they said, well, deal might be even worse than that in cattle, because they're the selected four babies. <coughs> So uh, I guess uh, bottom line take home message on all this is, is that you've got to take everything you hear with a grain of salt if it comes from different areas and if it's not backed up by research. Because it's easy to have anecdotal stories and say, I saw this, therefore by God it's got to be true. Doesn't necessarily mean that. <laughs> Perfect. Fine. Thank you.